three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the curriculum committee for March 17, 2022. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at her discretion and after co consultation with staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, would you please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee? Sure. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Present. Ms. Causey? Present. Mr. Thomas? Not here yet. And Ms. Cox, would you please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting? Sure. Dr. McComas? Present. Dr. Holmes? Present. Ms. Shea? Present. Dr. Wistead? Present. Dr. Elmendorf? Present. Dr. Perendozzi? Present. Mr. Conley? Present. Thank you very much, Ms. Cox. It looks like the first order of business is instructional materials for approval, and for that I'm going to turn it over to Dr. McComas. Thank you, uh, Ms. Mack and members of the committee. So we'll get started. Our first order of business, as you said, is instructional materials and services. Um, these are items that you will be seeing in the upcoming uh, board contracts committee, and, and today we're looking at what is it that they provide for the educational program aspect. So I'll turn it right over to Dr. Pierandozzi um, to talk about our non-public special education facilities. Good afternoon, thank you very much. The first contract, um, next slide please, thank you. The first contract is our non-public special education facilities contract. And this is the additional service provision of our non-public facilities. They allow us as far as the state um, requirements and that falls under Comar to provide a special um, facilities opportunities for our students and that is required for FAPE, right? Our free and appropriate public education. It provides the provision so that we are able, the provision so that we are able to offer that full continuum of services. These are for our students that have the need for continuous and intensive service delivery model needs, specialized instruction and interventions for those that have a multifaceted needs. They are offered in additional services such as our alternative schools, private and parochial. Related services are also offered to our students in these sites. Non-public happens to be one of them. In our non-public sites, there are approximately 53. There are more sites, but 53 of those offer special education services. They must be approved by MSDE for our students to attend these sites. Out of the 53 facilities that are listed within this contract that are allowable, we currently use approximately 36 of those sites. It is a five year contract. It would be upon approval five years and two months at this time because it's coming through to us now. They service or we have utilized services within our students for students with disabilities from age two through 21 years. Um, the students and services that are provided for this are a proportionate share. So we do fund, but we are also reimbursed for funding that is provided in these models or through this model of support that is provided for our students. And that is the service provision through each of these schools and contract. And I am happy to address any of your questions that you may have through the non-public facilities contract. Mr. Offerman or Ms. Causey, any questions? I have a question, but I'll go last. Uh, yes, I have a question. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Offerman. Thank you. Yes, when, when it says serves uh, between two and 21 years of age, uh, does does the service terminate when the uh, when the student graduates from high school? So does it continue past that? No, students may either graduate or it, we refer to it as aging out through their 21st birthday. 
Required by law, we are servicing students through their 21st birthday. Good. So, so our services end 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 upon uh, end upon graduation. Is that correct? They they may graduate or they may continue through their 21st birthday. No, Either I, one of those will allow that service to end. I, I, I guess I'm not, I'm sorry. I guess I'm I'm not making this very clear. If a student graduates, do we do we have do we have any responsibility uh, to pro, to provide services beyond that? If they graduate and receive a diploma, no, sir. Thank you. Ms. Cosby yes, and welcome, Mr. Thomas. Ms. Cosby, do you have any questions? If you do, you're muted. Thank you. Um, yes, I do. It was mentioned by Dr. Pirandozzi that there's um, some level of reimbursement. Um, and by whom would that be and what amount? And I um, am you know, concerned that there is no dollar amount related to this, not not by site, not by student. I mean, how many students do we have currently? How many have we had in the past? How does this address the um, corrective action plan um, that we have with MSDE? And that might not be the right term, corrective action plan, but Dr. Pirandozzi should understand what I mean. I do. Um, so there's a couple. I'll try to answer those questions one at a time. And if I miss any uh, part of the question, please, um, you know, repeat that for me so I can address it. The first part is um, the re reimbursement piece. So the reimbursement piece is done. Any type of reimbursement is done by the state. MSDE reimburses us a portion of that for every student we are reimbursed. We first must pay up to $29,000 upfront per student, right? We we must first, that's our, for every single student, $29,000 is a part that we pay immediately upfront. After the $29,000, depending on that student's tuition, the anything over 29,000 is a 70-30 split. Um, and so that's, that, that's the total cost or formula Per student. Now, depending on the site, the non public site, that varies based on student tuition. So that, that's the formula for payment or repayment. Um, that's one, I believe I answered both two questions out of that one. Now, our student and our student population, past and current, uh, those numbers change. Enrollment changes throughout the year. Currently, we have a little over 700 students that are enrolled in non-public currently. That number does change. It changes, could change from the beginning of the year, the middle, the end of the year. The population, I believe it's around 715 currently, um, and that number could have changed since the last time I checked those numbers, right? I We're looking at them throughout time. Um, and Part of corrective action, if we want to speak to corrective action, corrective action, some of those students are there through settlement processes, um, through dispute resolution processes, and part of corrective action doesn't always land them there in a non-public part of corrective action in our system is improving system processes or services, and those those do happen currently in, the, in our comprehensive schools and how we may put into place services for an individual student. So it doesn't always equate corrective action with non-public, but um, that's something we are looking at as a system and as a department, because I'm the type of individual that sees this as they are our students, you know, our babies, and I kind of want them back. So, um, and I believe that we can service students in our own way, in our own fashion, and that we are capable as a system to provide instruction. Now, there are some students, let's be honest, that require and that have needs that exceed what not only we can do in our comprehensive sites, but also in our public separate day schools. There are some students that have needs that require that are as intensive that they exceed the level of intensity and frequency that require a, a, a non-public special education facility. And so we want to be realistic about that and that we do have a need for certain facilities. 
And I hope I answered everything, Ms. Kazi. OK. Mr. Thank Thomas, you. helpful. Oh. Um, thank, thank you, Ms. Fozzi. Mr. Thomas, do you have any questions? I do, yes. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Um, so back in October, uh, we had the Maryland Association of Board of Education's conference, and there I met with someone from the Maryland Association of Non-Public Special Education Facilities, MANSEF. Um, and I actually went to visit one of their schools and got to interact with some BCPS students that are current students at that school. So one of my questions is, you know, although these students that are going to our, our non-public schools for special education needs or other needs, they're still our students. So how do we continue to interact with them while they're at these other schools? How do we continue to um, make sure that their learning proficiency or, or, or that their development is consistent with BCPS standards as well. So in our Office of Placement, we have staff um, that hold IEPs that continue to review and that is annual, of course. And so they hold the IEPs, they are maintaining that. We are taking a much more active role in monitoring now because the we need to monitor monitor progress making sure you know we need to ensure that each and every site is providing for those educational services as outlined in that IEP um, and we want to ensure that if that is occurring and that they have the ability to return back to our comprehensive sites where we believe we offer the best educational services, we want to make sure that we can do that and bring them back onto our comprehensive campuses where they have access to, you know, the a, a numerous in, um, extracurricular activities where we can engage them in some of our um, higher level advanced courses and, and engage them in some of our curriculum and and services and responsibilities that we have as as educators and as a system to take them right to reach their maximum potential. And that's what we are looking to do. So we are engaging more and more in that. And as we um, do that, we are having a couple of students return each time. So that is something that we are lifting in our placement office and our new placement in LRE. So we are um, developing that currently and we've, we've already brought back a couple of students that may not seem like a lot to you, but that is um, two more than we have done in the previous six months. So we're on our way. Thank you. Um, so that, that's incredible that we're able to bring some students back as, the, as they're using the resources at the non-public schools and being able to develop in a way that allows them to come back to BCVS. But when they're in the public schools, you know, do we provide besides the tuition cost, you know, do we provide any other supports, any other resources from BCPS to those students? Or do we provide any other supports to these schools from with BCPS individuals? Well, yes, the, the non-public schools still have an opportunity. Related services is provided to them. Um, the non-public schools can attend their staff, can attend professional development for for example, our um, IEP chair trainings and things and other professional learning opportunities still have an opportunity to engage. We do share information as well as sharing our curriculum. We share our curriculum with each of them annually. And so we do, we do engage in a lot of interaction and interagency collaboration and interprofessional collaboration. Thank you. And what about the transportation services for these students? Do we provide the transportation for them to go to the non-public schools? Yes, we do. Anything that is required in transportation by law is also provided to our students as well. If it is engaged and part of a related service in their IEP, we are required to do so. OK, and you mentioned that there were 37 non-public schools this year that we're involved with. Ms. Cause, you asked how many students and you said it was fluctuating. Do you have the number for this year? For students? The number of students, yeah, that are involved in. in I would, no. The last time I had done, checked, which was not that long ago, it was approximately 715. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you. I have three quick questions. Two actually are piggybacking on something Mr. Offerman said and uh, Mr. Thomas. Um, I worked for many years with children in foster care, and a, a harsh reality is when kids age out, they just age out with some supports, but not supports. And Mr. Offerman asked what happens to a child in a non-public placement who graduates. And I believe the answer was the child is, is out of the process at that point. But do we provide any transition services to help that student to the next level of his or her life? 
So um, as far as a student that that graduates from a non public setting, um, I do not as far as in special education, we may uh, the state monitors some of what they do as they exit from a any graduation setting. But as far as BCPS, no, I do not know that they are monitored outside of that. Um, transition services. Let me add that transition services are provided as part of their IEP. That is a transition. They have transition goals. They have a transition part of their IEP. It's a transition page that should be developed in every student's IEP. That is a required part starting at 14 through their either graduation or through their 21st birthday. And transition services, as well as outside agency integration, such as vocational rehabilitation, all of that should be involved in any student. Um, as a guardian ad litem, I want you to know I have seen many of those students that do age out of the system, um, working with them, and I so understand what you mean by that, and that's all children, not just students with disabilities. So we want to ensure, right, that they're working on that, and that's and that's all of our children. But um, so in that process with non-public, some of that transition should be related to in and embedded within their IEPs. So we are hoping, I would hope, that they would be working on some of their goals for career, career ed, exactly. career ed placement, that they are working on some of those embedded in that IEP goal. Thank you. And then um, I'm going to limit just to one more question. How and how often do we evaluate the efficacy of the non-public schools that we use? Um, can you, in what fashion are you talking about? Are we doing audits? Are we doing auditing the IEP? Or are we talking about? The, the entire program um, are, you know, how well does this non-public school um, meet the requirements of, a, of our students who are placed there, their IEPs? How, of, how do we look at outcomes that we expect and outcomes that we achieve? Um, okay. You know, are we making sure that when we send a child to a non-public placement that the placements are meeting the child's needs? Okay, so I'm gonna answer that in two ways. First, starting with the state, right? So the state is the entity that will um, monitor and evaluate the overall performance of that educational facility. And are they, do they meet the state standards to maintain as a state approved facility to provide the educational interest of students based on what they applied for? So, and they do that annually. As a matter of fact, we are set for a site visit on April 8th to one of those facilities that provides students. We have one student that attends there. Um, and that would be in Garrett County and, and that site facility we have to attend. We have to conduct a site visit. The state will be doing so. So the state conducts that and they, I believe they conduct that annually for each and every site. That's one way in which that is done and that is carried out by their criteria. Um, for us, we conduct that annually by holding that IEP meeting. And then the student goes through the same for the individual students needs and they do the same thing both on an annual IEP basis as well as their three year evaluation and that's for the students needs and then we check progress quarterly for that student's annual progress review based on their annual um, their academic performance and or whatever's on their goals. So if it's social, emotional or behavioral <coughs> needs, if it's communication, health or physical needs. So all of those are based on their IEP goals. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, and thank you every thank you for all this information. It's been very helpful. Um, do I have a motion to approve um, contract LLY 425-22. So moved, so Thomas. moved, Offerman. Second, Thomas. Ms. Cox, could you please do a roll call vote? Ms. Mack. Yes. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Causey, we're moving on because we have um, four more contracts to talk about. Can we yes. submit it's not a question? It's a short statement. Okay, go ahead. 
Um, I have um, said in other meetings, I think it would it's um, necessary for this committee to also understand the presentation of the financial aspects of this, um, especially related to the changes, um, improvements, as we've heard um, that are happening and uh, what the goals are. Um, so I'll, I'll be abstaining from this. Um, and I just wanted to say that up front. Okay, and thank I, you. And, and I did and actually and ask for that information, just so you know, Ms. Causey. Um, and I will follow up with Dr. McComas on a going forward basis so that we have that. So if you could go ahead, Ms. Um, Cox, with the roll call vote. Sure. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Rothman? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Thank Dr. You. McComas, um, the next um, item is temporary adult assistance and therapeutic behavioral aids. Yes, thank you. And also, Dr. Pirandusi, if you will go ahead and walk us through that one. Absolutely. So this contract is strictly coming to you today for a name change. One of the providers that already exist in our system that we do utilize has acquired an additional partner and so it comes to you for a name change but i would just like to update you on what this contract and does in the service provisions of this contract these are temporary assistance and therapeutic behavioral aids that provide services that are unique to our system and they are um service provisions that are specialized. Um, they do behavioral supports that are increased in specific situations. They are short term. They are um, behavioral. They are learning supports. They are really physical mobility. Sometimes with ABA specific needed, there are therapeutic um, needs and so forth, but they are short term contractual folks that provide that in this. And as I said before, this is strictly a name change that we must bring, bring back to you um, for approval at this time. Thank you. Are there any questions? In the absence of questions, um, do I have a motion to approve this contract for therapeutic behavioral aids? So move, Thomas. Second May offer. I, may I have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Cox? Sure. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. McComas or Ms. Shea, could we move on to musical instruments, supplies, and materials, please? Sure can. Dr. McComas, may I jump in? Okay, so the first contract that you will be seeing coming forward, uh, this again is an uh, update. We are coming back with contract number LKO for it should be 41619, not 4416. Um, this is a modification to increase the spending authority. Um, that is to allow for the continued purchase of musical instruments, um, personal protective equipment for instruments such as bell covers or special masks that have the slits that we do still use. Um, as well as materials for dance education. Um, I know, um, Ms. Mack, as you referenced, the, there's not a per pupil cost for this particular contract, but I did bring some numbers of some instrument costs just to give you some uh, ballpark ideas. Um, so flutes are $360, trumpets and trombones are just over $500, Clarinets are $416, uh, violins are $261. Um, the um, last bullet that you'll see, a big part of this um, spending authority increase is for the opening of our new Rossville Elementary School. So as part of the FF&E, um, we do have an opportunity to use um, opening um, startup costs to purchase instruments for the instrumental music program, um, as well as um, using some capital money for some of the larger pieces like the carts and things of that nature. Um, we have seen in the past two years, um, again, we certainly buy new musical instruments and replace instruments, um, but those um, bullets around PPE for instruments and then, of course, the new opening of Rossville Elementary is really what uh, precipitated this change. And I will put in the chat the correct number. There's just an extra four there. Are, are you finished, um, Michelle? Um, well, I am with this one. The next slide is the next contract, so I wanted to pause here for questions. OK, if we, yeah, because um, so I just have a question. Since I've sure. been on the board, I believe 
we seem to see a contract for musical instruments at least every year. Yes. Can are we doing I, annual contracts and would we be no, saving so, money? And, and, and Ms. Mack, I smiled because I said the same thing to my team when this came back up. I was like, I, this feels like deja vu. So there's a couple of things. One is okay. there's a different contract that is about musical instrument cleaning and repairs. I so that's that. the one that, right. So that's the one that we came up last time. So that is part of the confusion. The other thing is it's not a new contract, but it is a spending authority increase. We got ahead of this plan spending be, mostly because of the addition of the PPE. Um, and then certainly now we want to make sure that we're in a good position for the opening of the school. So it's not a new contract. We still have the same seven vendors, but it is an increase in spending um, due to some of those unexpected. When we first brought this contract, um, I think it's now three years ago, that wasn't on the radar per se. So that was the same question I asked of my team. And just a clarification, that last bullet, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, is that specifically for music? Yes. yes. Okay. Yep. And then my last comment before I go to other board members is, during the pandemic, were we sending instruments home? Were we doing um, were we doing music classes? We were, yeah. Virtually? So we we did a number of things. So um, you may remember in that uh, first spring, a lot of schools did materials pickups. And so some schools helped get instruments back in the hands of kids. Some students went home on March 13th of 2020 with their instrument. Um, so we did also, that was another spending increase. When they came back, we saw them in quite a, um, a oh, right. range of disrepair that needed um, some support after, you know, typically our music teachers as they're coming in every week can do small fixes along the way. And because they were not in for so long, we did have to um, catch up there. So yeah, music kept going and in a lot of ways adapted. So we explored lots of different digital tools, um, but music kept going, although we're not sad that we're back in person and starting to have some of our um, opportunities for performance as well. Okay, well, I appreciate the information. Board members, sure. do you have questions? Committee members, I should say. Mr. Thomas, you're Thank muted. You. Okay, now you're not. <laughs> Thank you. So my question is about the PPE for the instruments. Uh, now that we are mask optional in BCPS, I'm assuming we wouldn't be purchasing as much PPE or will we be purchasing it? Can you just describe what exactly we're purchasing? Yeah, so we that's yeah, that's a great question. So because the masks are optional, we have specific masks for playing instruments. So in order to make them optional for students, we do still have a supply of them available. You're right that it probably won't be as many. Um, we also want to be poised. We know that this virus is really unpredictable. Um, hopefully we're we're on the, the right path, but we also want to be poised that we're not scrambling like we have been in the past. So we want to make sure that we have the spending in place. Um, and then the bell covers for the instruments are still in use. We are still using those because of the differential in terms of understanding how that's another avenue. Um, and just to make sure that kids all feel safe. We can't always accomplish the distance in our instrumental music spaces as they're preparing and performing for concerts. So um, as um, Ms. Somerville always talks to us about removing layers of mitigation, so if in this instance in a performance you can't have the same distance, we would then still use those bell covers and some of those other PPE. So we do think there'll be a reduction, but not an elimination. And we want to be poised. Thank you. I actually saw, I went to the Southwest, not Southwest, to um, Southwark Magnet Middle School and saw some students in their instrumental music class with a magnet uh, using the PPE. The question also is, is this PPE reusable or is it like a face mask? Like do students not reuse them? Do they get new masks every time? Just so um, I would say they're both and. They are reusable. They're not disposable, but they're not forever. So it, de it depends on the use <laughs> and, and uh, how much love they get. So um, they're not one time, but they're also not necessarily forever. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Ms. Causey or Mr. Offerman, Ms. Causey, do you have any questions? Thank you. I just wondered what was the um, contract modification amount to this contract, which was a million five. Sure, I will pull that up for you right now. So the previous contract spending authority was 1.5. The modification is 1.4, bringing the total to 2.9 um, and then keeping the end date of 2024 the same. And so is this a part of this? Uh, was it a um, going to be part of a budget line transfer because there's some additional funds this year that were not uh, known, you know, two I years ago. Most, I, I think most of it, um, we have not um, 
discussed a budget line transfer specifically for this because a big part of that increase is about the funding that was already set aside for Rossville Elementary School. Um, so we have not had to at this point. The music office does have a general um, line item for music instruments. Um, and so in the in years past, we've also used some of the supplemental grant funding to fund some of that difference. So I think at this point, we have not yet discussed the need for a budget line transfer, um, mostly because we're braiding multiple funding sources. OK, thank you. Sure. Mr. Offerman, any questions? None. Not at this time, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, may I have a motion to approve contract LKO 416-19, please? So I moved Offerman. Sarah, second. Second, Thomas. Ms. Cox, may I have a roll call, vo roll call vote, please? Sure. Um, Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And then I will turn it over to um, Next one's like me Ms. again. again. Yes, <laughs> it's me again. Thank you. Um, so today I'm here. Contract MWE 80219 will be coming forward um, for a name change of the vendor. So um, we um, will be coming back, I think, either in April or May um, to talk more specifically about the Elevation platform because it's a phenomenal resource that we use to support our multilingual learners. Uh, but in the interest of time today, I wanted to at least describe it a little bit. Um, Elevation is a database, but it um, supports our multilingual learners by providing multiple sources of data based on the WIDA assessment as well as parent notification letters and some of the communication resources um, and includes modules for professional learning as well as instructional strategies. Um, the price for pupil, since I know you will um, ask that piece, um, we actually you'll see on the contract document when it comes to the board that we um, pay for part of this out of operating and part of it out of our Title III grant. And so the Title III grant is able to pay for the strategies portion that supports the professional learning and the instructional um, parts of this database. And then the operating fund pays for the actual platform. Um, so the cost per pupil for students for the strategies and professional learning Learning, which is really much more of the instructional piece, is $14. Um, and that's not for $112,000. That's for the um, close to $11,000 of our English learners, but does give access to every teacher. So it isn't just for ESOL teachers. It's every teacher in the system as well as every administrator. Um, and then the platform itself cost is uh, $13.25 per pupil. And so, as I said, we will come back and talk and do a live drive and let you see all that this platform has to offer. Um, but uh, because we had a full agenda, wanted to at least give you that piece. The purpose of it coming to the contracts committee is simply because Elevation, the company, was purchased by Curriculum Associates. So there will be a name change on contract MWE 80219. Um, Thank you, Ms. Shea. I would like to say that when I saw this contract, I reached out to some ESOL teachers um, who are my go-to people when I have questions, and to a person, they raved about it um, and told me, you know, there was a little bit of a rough start because I think it rolled out in during the pandemic. And there was pandemic. so much going on, but that right now it is fixed, and I'm reading from the email, and it is a great program, so thank you. Yeah, it's a game changer. It really is. And it was really unfortunate timing, um, but we've recovered and we're, you know, the ESOL office has worked tirelessly as well as DOIT to help support it. And it's a game changer for supporting our multilingual learners. So thank you. And that's basically that. what the teachers with whom I spoke said. So are Great. any other questions for board members from board members? Hearing Ms. none, Mac, do I have a, Ms. I'm Mac, sorry. Go ahead, Ms. I have a question in the chat. I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Um, Yes, so um, it has been um, discussed, maybe not indirectly, about uh, English learners at the secondary level being um, moved to their home schools rather than the regional locations, and the Public Works recommendations also supported that. Um, so I'm wondering what is the timing of that? Um, and it's wonderful that this uh, program, every teacher and every administrator has access to it because then as the students move, they maintain access and then uh, every teacher in every administrator in every school will be able to prepare and so forth. So I just wondered what uh, where that was. 
Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to speak to that, uh, Ms. Causey. Um, and, and for those of you who have been on the committee for several years, you'll recall we actually presented a proposal around our sort of a, a plan in December of 2019, I think it was. It was November or December, right? In the before times. And um, so thank you, Ms. Kazi, for bringing that up. Um, and so we actually are going to be bringing a whole presentation related to that to the May Curriculum Committee. Uh, because uh, what you'll see, and, and you already know this, you know, our English multilingual population is uh, growing. It, it continues to grow. To grow, and and so our model that we had in place um, for decades is really no longer a model that's serving our students well. Um, and I'm sure at the time when that was put in place many decades ago, that was a, a best practice and appropriate for the volume uh, of, of of learners. Um, so we're excited to bring that forward. So thank you for asking. And I would offer to your point, Ms. Kazi, this platform and the professional learning and the ability to support that will be critical to that plan. So you're absolutely right. It's um, we recently had an opportunity to do professional learning with all administrators um, to, to help them understand the value because all of us need to be teachers of our multilingual learners. Um, and then certainly it helps prepare those um, schools to be in a position to receive the students well. Well, I really look forward to that presentation and I know that there's um, so many things that our students and families can benefit when they are connected with their community. community. So I Absolutely. Really appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If not, uh, may I have a motion to approve MWE 802-19? So moved, Thomas. Is there a second? So second, Fawzi. Thank <laughs> you. Um, Ms. Cox, could you do a roll call vote, please? Sure. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank um, you. So before we move away from this, I would just like to point out that we are ahead of schedule. As I turn <laughs> it over to Ms. Shea and Ms. Billingsley to um, provide information on our social studies elective pre um, information. Thank you, and hopefully we will not take care of that. And we will keep us ahead, as I know I have a tendency to do. So good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for having us. As you mentioned, Ms. Mack, I am joined today by Director of Social Studies, Mr. John Billingsley. Um, I want to offer this really is a presentation that came based on inquiries from our student member, Mr. Thomas. He is very passionate um, about elective offerings and about understanding all that our students uh, can and should have opportunities to experience. Um, it was bumped a couple of times, so I might may be refreshing our memories that he even asked about this, um, but this is um, something that I know a lot of our students and families are passionate about, um, and so we're happy today to talk more deeply about social studies. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Billingsley, um, who's going to be able to share lots of information about what we currently offer and then also where we believe we're going next. So Mr. Billingsley. Well, thank you, Megan. And um, I think this was Christian brought this to our attention, said, hey, I want to know more about this. So I'm glad to be able to be here today to talk about our electives. And so feel free to jump in with your questions as we kind of go along. So what's what kind of what's the landscape? Uh, we currently offer about 40 different social study elective courses spread out over a variety of levels. So we have our honors levels and we'll talk a little bit about a change that was made between standard and honors when it comes to our electives. We have AP courses. We have our IB courses. International Baccalaureate and our magnet courses and our dual enrollment enrollment courses. And Megan, you're going to have to I'm gonna let you use the. I don't have control of the PowerPoint today. Oh, just call next slide. I believe Tracy. Next slide. Next yes, slide. Mr. <laughs> um, can I just stop you? Yeah. Are you would you like us to ask questions? Because Mr. Offerman yeah. has a question or will that throw you off of your uh, presentation? I think this is kind of this is an informational piece. So I'd rather answer your questions as we go along. OK, Mr. Offerman, go right ahead. Actually, uh, actually, my uh, my question has to do with something later later in the in the in the presentation. OK, OK. Thank you. <clears throat> and so we've made a we made a move over the past two years in terms of a process and, and moving all of our electives from standard levels to honors levels credit. We figured that it, though the required courses like let's say American government might be offered on different levels. All of our co courses beyond that that were electives should all be offered at the honors level. Um, and this allowed this created a more equitable shift because what we realized is that 
schools were labeling things honors and standard, but there was really a very little differentiation between the actual curriculum itself. And so to create a consistency and address equitability, we've we shifted all of our all of our elective courses into honors. Um, so for all you know, like all non AP, IB, magnet, all those honors level credits are now offered at the honors level. Um, and you can see a short list that will kind of unpack it along the right hand side of your screen um, of the electives that we offer. I see a question coming in from Mr. Offerman and a question from Christian. Again, my, uh, OK, later, later. Yes, thank you. OK, we'll keep on Mr. going down. Thomas, there. go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Max. So I know that one of the, the biggest things, especially with high achieving students taking honors courses or taking elective courses is that they don't want to step down from taking a higher level course to match their QPA or GPA. So I'm wondering, because these have been honors level courses, um, I know this is the, the first year, but have we seen an increase in students that are taking the electives? Um, what I can say is I don't have that data today. That is data that I can kind of dig into. I think you really see more because the shift just happened. So I think more accurate data will come about next year and the following year. So I think we're a little ahead of when we can collect that level, you know, that that amount of data. But I will offer that, Mr. Thomas, you're spot on and the feedback that students gave us um, about what classes they, you know, they would say to us point blank, I'd love to take that class, but it's going to affect my, my GPA. And um, what was important to us and what Mr. Billingsley described is that um, there has to be a curricular expectation shift, right? Because when we talk about the weight of a course, because it does impact GPA and QPA, we want to make sure that it's reflective of the change in rigor in how those courses are being expected. And so that's why we couldn't just wave a wand. We had to actually review the courses and ensure, and we actually have a process very similar to that for GT that we work in collaboration with the Office of Advanced Act Academics. Um, and in fact, right now, my entire team is working through that rubric from an equity lens just to see if we need to continue to make um, changes to that. So um, because it, it is exactly what students told us, we would love to, because we do look at enrollment of courses when we make decisions about whether we need to thin out our course catalog to make room for new offerings. Um, because in addition to having these courses available within the uh, master course catalog, then schools, of course, make decisions about what they're going to be able to offer and run based on staffing and space, and that stems from student interest. And so we know that that is one big cycle. So um, you were, were spot on with that piece. Um, but I think it's a really good data point to, to track, especially for some of our courses. And Mr. Billingsley is going to go into what are traditionally our most popular popular courses because um, we do have some data on that, but it would be interesting to now track changes that we notice. Yeah. And Before I'll say we Chris move on, I do have a quick question. I, I can look at the information in blue and figure out what everything on here is going to offer except for big history. That's a great okay. question. <laughs> that is a That's great actually question. one of the ones I like the best. Go ahead, Mr. Billing. Okay. Please. So big history, it, it, the concept is it's more thematic. So rather than study history and more of a chronological sort of approach to it, you explore it around a major concept. Like the idea would be the impact on salt. And so you'd look at salt historically, the role of salt through history from an economic, political perspective. And so you take these big, big. ideas, <laughs> big ideas, and you kind of approach them from kind of a multi-dimensional ap approach within the social sciences in order to kind of investigate and learn history that way. I will say it it is a course that we only recently brought on. It takes um, a specialized staff maybe or, or understanding in order to implement it and training to get there. I believe that Kenwood in the upcoming year, Kenwood and Parkville are both exploring the implementation of that, um, but it takes someone who, who definitely a different mind in terms of an approach in terms of a history teacher to do it and so um, i'm excited to see what parkville and ken would do in in terms of their approach um, but it is something that it, it definitely adds a different perspective and a different lens because we're so kind of rigid and thinking chronologically but history oftentimes is best explored through a, them a thematic approach and that's what big history is Thank you. One of the comments you made actually is a question um, with this with this change for I think you referred to it, Ms. Shea, as a curricular expectation shift. Mm -hmm. 
where do we build into our professional learning? Where is that built into our professional learning for our teachers? I'm, I guess you're shocked that I'm asking that question. <laughs> Not even a little, Miss Mac. So um, we, um, our main uh, area for something like that is professional study day, because that's an opportunity Mr. Billingsley gets every single social studies teacher in the county um, for one whole day. And so that would be where we would have an opportunity um, to gather them in job alike groups. So we can gather small PLCs around, you know, teachers from across schools that are teaching a particular course. So they have an opportunity to dig into that as well as to network and form that professional learning community. Um, and then also through, of course, our department chairs. Um, they are a big lever for this as well. But um, Mr. Billingsley, would you add anything yeah. to what I've already said? And I'd only say that part of that professional development day that we try to really reach out to kind of our institutions of higher learning and bring in guest speakers that speak okay. to one. We can't hit each one every year, but we try to pick one or two each year to, to, to support, um, to kind of build that knowledge base um, for our teachers. Okay, thank you so much. I love history, so I'm very excited about all of this. Um, Mr. Thomas, you looks like you had a follow up question. Yeah, I just wanted to state that, you know, these course offerings here at Eastern Tech, I think we've only offered one of them um, throughout my four years, and that's military history. And I really wish I had the opportunity to explore all of these because history is my passion. So uh, as we continue on, I'm, I'm going to share more, but I just wanted to state that. Thank you. Well, yep. and, and I, yeah, and I'm, kind of, I'm sad that you didn't have an opportunity because one thing we realized that at least we pride ourselves in social studies is there is a wide variety of, of courses that are that are open to students, right, in social sciences and social studies, right? And so it, it, I love the fact that I, I, know, I know your love for history, um, and but I'm glad that we all can offer these throughout the county. But there are certain schools that kind of lock in and, and they get stuck in maybe, maybe a little bit of a rut and they offer only a few. Um, but these are the variety and it really should shift based on student interest. And that should drive that 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 enrollment piece. Mr. Billingsley, that that actually um, prompts a question in my mind, um, and I know it's not something you may not be able to answer, but would we ever get to the point based on a, a widespread interest that we could offer not permanent virtual, but students that Oh, look at uh, look. <laughs> so, you know, there's a there's three students at every high school who want to learn about abnormal psychology. Have we looked at a model that would take one of our social studies teachers and perhaps um, do something thinking outside of the box? I think we're standing at the cusp of that happening. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think that's where we are. I think this and, one of the upsides of COVID it has, has expanded it has our taught, yep. minds. <laughs> And, and okay, Dr. Elmendorf is giving you smiley faces in the chat. I think that is a silver lining that we've learned a lot about those flexible pathways. It does help solve across content areas, not just student interest, but we have students who uh, hit a wall with a language that they're studying and the feeder pattern high school they're attending doesn't offer or a student that wants. So we know that there's an opportunity for us to be um, creative and responsive um, for just that reason. Um, the other piece that I wanted to um, address that Mr. Thomas brought up um, and while today Mr. Billingsley is here really talking from a CNI lens, um, as you all know, the choices about what courses get offered in a school is a multifaceted piece because there is a limited amount of classroom space and staffing. And so um, that is an ongoing conversation that we have with schools is how do students know about all the depth and breadth so that they can advocate for things that they're interested in? Um, because typically schools start from, and I know Mr. Offerman with his background in counseling will remember, we have the course request process, um, but there is a little bit of a cycle because if it isn't on the registration form, you can't request it, right? <laughs> so there is a lot to be um, to be explored about how, of course, our school leaders try to make the best decisions they can, um, and how do we make sure that our students have a strong voice um, in advocating for what they want. And to Mr. Billingsley's point, um, some of our teachers, some of these courses came about years and years ago because someone had a passion and a topic of interest and wanted to, to, to start doing something. Um, you, you have to have the, all of that magic come together where you have that course, you have the space, you have the student enrollment interest, 
Um, and that's one of the challenges that we're thinking through around the um, virtual option to go across schools. Definitely helps with the staffing um, question. Still does bring up some space and schedule considerations at the school, but it certainly does provide us new opportunities that we think are exciting. Thank you. Um, Ms. Causey, it looks like you had a question or a comment. Thank you. I had a question earlier, and I know we're speaking about social studies. Um, which is very, very important, but I also wondered if this um, curricular expectation shift is taking place in other content areas. Yes, ma'am. And are, will there be presentations on that? Uh, so we certainly can do, I mean, we can do electives in every content and walk through the, the course registration guide, and I certainly would be happy to work with Dr. McComas about this process I referenced, that uh, about how do we determine the level of rigor for a course and what does that look like? Um, but your original question, the expectation, as Mr. Billingsley will share with you from, from my entire uh, academic team, um, first is that standards should be offered at the standard. I think there's a misconception and connotation that somehow standard means below grade level. And our state standards and national standards are rigorous. And if students are taking a course at the level of the standard, that should be rigorous and relevant. And if a course is going to be offered at a different level of rigor, whether it's honors or GT, or AP, there must be a distinction and it must not just be more. So it's not just instead of three books, you read five. It has to really stem from this idea of application and um, rigor and how students use that. So that expectation is absolutely system wide across all the content areas. Um, each content has a different area of focus. I know in art, they've been really focusing on what GT at middle school looks like in terms of portfolio development. So again, stems from that same expectation, but has a different application for that content. Thank you. And just quickly um, sure. commenting on the um, question and the answer around um, specific staff expertise being applied um, around the county. I think that's a that's an excellent idea because at that level too, the students are um, um, have above, they're well versed in how to learn right. so that the virtual op option will uh, most likely work better for them than, you know, um, than for a lot of students that are still developing how they learn. Sure, um, and it allows for that self pace and that ability for them to, to go even further. And you have to have someone that has that passion and can keep up, right? <laughs> right, and, and I know that the school system has made arrangements for students, yeah. um, but most of it is that they've gone off campus to a community college or even Hopkins or other um, universities. But that has logistical problems, right? And so not every student has access to transportation. Uh, transportation. Right. And so I believe this can really be an equitable way to have um, greater courses available. Um, and I would also hope that, um, and I know that we hired a new um, central office scheduling uh, staff member to look at the ways that the semester schedule, which aligns with um, a smaller number of topics, but more overall through the year and aligns with our college um, colleges in terms of being able to fit that in for the students to be able to fit that in and, and staff be able to fit it in so and remain in their in their school that's great thank you sure I think we're on slide two, so right I'm, along. I was going to say, I told <laughs> yeah. you I would ruin that we were at I was going to say, we're losing our this space. This is a shared our, our responsibility. Timing. This is not just me. Go ahead, Mr. Billingsley, yeah. next slide. Yeah, next slide. <laughs> and so then we look at our um, AP offerings. We offer eight advanced placement courses with one little caveat. So you can see the list of comparative government, econ, euro, human geography, AP psych, U, uh, AP US, um, government, AP US, and AP world. This year, and kind of excitingly, we've worked with the College Board. We've identified two schools, um, both Milford Mill Academy and Randallstown High School. They're going to pilot the new AP African American History course. Um, so that'll be a pilot that we launched this year. Um, so we're excited to, to expand our offerings um, through the pilot phase and then hopefully um, next year or the following year be able to offer it um, countywide as an additional AP course. Mr. Billingsley, I have a question. Yeah. Um, and I, we are going to get finished on time. <laughs> but we are living through unprecedented times as far as world history. Would teachers have the ability to, or the flexibility, I should say, to incorporate what is going on in the world today in a fixed curriculum? Um, and to your point about looking at something um, 
you know, I, I don't know what word you Thematically, use. right? Yes, I mean, would a teacher be able to say, what are the underlying reasons? What do you think the underlying reasons of what's going on in Russia today from both an economic perspective, a power perspective? What, can, could they deviate from a written curriculum in AP world history? I guess that, is my question. The answer to that question is, well, I have to move around a little bit because I think the light, light went out. out. <laughs> but um, the answer is um, absolutely yes. I mean, that would be the expectation. One, it ties in that current event, which is inappropriate in a socialist classroom, especially when that world events are occurring like right now. The other part of about that is the inquiry focus, and that's something we've worked with since I have been in my position to really focus to, to to work on students carrying the cognitive effort, the load to build the inquiry in order to investigate those positions and not just saying same things as fact, but saying things that, as making a claim and then supporting evidence. And and uh, Ms. Causey is actually putting in the chat something that would add to that. We also share links to resources through so many of our county approved resources have documents um, and and keep up with current events and offer um, resources for teachers. And the other thing that's important to note is that our teachers teach the students and they teach the standards. So it isn't even necessarily a deviation because the curriculum provides that roadmap. So it is absolutely um, something and, and for many of our students to not address that would feel as if you weren't providing that relevance and that rigor for students because they're seeing it happening and, and the classroom is a phenomenal place for them to make sense with what they're hearing and seeing. Right, and that's, his, that's really why history. I brought it up because it would be so hard to ignore. Uh, how, uh, and, and, and not fair to students, you know, right. to, to students. Right. So. Well, and, and I, I would say, you know, Miss um, Ms. Mack, that, you know, teaching is an art, right? It is not a rigid, you know, step by step. Today is day 32, turn the page, say this, do that. That is not what curriculum is. And in truth be told, I would be upset with any of our social studies teachers who are not leveraging the the world events that are happening to draw parallel anal analysis to both World War One and World War Two. If they are not doing that, we have a problem. So oh, that's ahead. wonderful to hear. <laughs> and and yeah. I'm to diverge just a little bit. We just recently had the Model UN, and many of those students yes. are AP World Kids, and the level of engagement that they had around the current Ukraine crisis was was phenomenal. phenomenal. And that and that understanding comes from conversations that they're Classroom having in their discussions. classroom. Perfect. That's a wonderful. All of you gave wonderful answers. Thank you. <laughs> Hang up now, John. No, I'm just kidding. Go to the next. <laughs> well, I, I next all I can do not to <laughs> dash out into classrooms and teach myself That's right now. Herself, right. Being the world history teacher uh, myself, it's just like, oh my god. I know, and I mean, I'm not a world history teacher, but so many of these topics are relevant, and I feel like I could run out in the classroom too. But moving right along, Mr. Billingsley, we would welcome you along. Ms. Mack, I have a comment I'd like to make. That's okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Thomas. Please go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to state that the, the description that was being had about how our, our teachers are leveraging current events is, is is so true, especially last year in my AP US history class. I mean, during the uh, the yeah. inauguration, during the insurrection, during all the world events, we were tying it back to so many historical events in the past, and our, my teachers did an incredible job of doing that. And it, and it happened in AP world history and AP government. It continues to happen. I also wanted to comment on the virtual option, uh, the possibility that we're on the cusp of right now to offer s these courses virtually. I was a huge proponent of adding AP comparative government to our my school's curriculum last year. I wanted to take that course so bad. We didn't have the staffing or the space. And if I was to have a virtual option and, you know, I could take one period out of my day to go sit in the library on my computer and investigate with my, my students, that would be incredible. It's something that is currently being developed in Montgomery County and in Howard County. And it's actually their smobs that were spearheading some of the budget decisions and making amendments to the budget to I I increase that. So it's been incredible to be in collaboration with them and learn about the, 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 the possibility of this for BCPS in the future. And Christian, your awesome. advocacy brought about that course. So that's just the true that to action. And there it is right there. Thank uh, you. Next slide there, Ms. Shea. And so at both Towson and Eastern Tech, we have the law and public policy magnets, um, which is based on an introduction to law, international law, constitutional law, and then the public policy uh, issues to action. So those are the four courses that students take within those magnet programs. And that's cur currently offered at Towson and, and Eastern Tech, 
with I hopefully an expansion um, to a, a West Side school um, here in the next couple of years. Next that was going to be my question. So yeah, good preemptive answer. Thank okay, you. Yeah, we're working to, to expand that to the uh, West Side School. Um, that's one of our priorities. Next slide. OK, so our IB and dual enrollment um, at both Kenwood and Newtown, they have the IB program, which they take AP US, um, AP US government or GT American government. They take an AP US and they take IB history one and IB history two. Both those that combination of the 11th and 12th grade that fulfills their world history credit. Um, so that's that last. So they're making sure they're hitting both the IP program and um, the MSD Comar requirements for for world history. <clears throat> then our dual credit courses that we offer in conjunction with CCBC, we offer abnormal, um, econ, macro, personal finance, which is an additional this year, um, introduction to philosophy, psychology, um, and history of the U.S. So those are dual credit courses that so we Mr. offer. So Mr. Opperman has a question about personal finance. I want to make sure. We yeah. Uh, yes. Um, first, uh, if someone can help me with this, in order to take a dual credit course with CCB, do you have to pass uh, or do you have to do any, uh, have to get through any, uh, any uh, uh, qualifying uh, tests or, uh, or, or can any, uh, or can any student sign up? Respond. Hi, do you want me to respond? Oh, it looks yeah, like Mr. Thomas knows how to respond. Do you want to say Mr. Thomas? <laughs> sure, I, I mean, I can share, yeah. So I, I have someone who's taken two of these courses at CCBC. I took, I've taken Introduction to Philosophy and Introduction to Psych over the summers. Um, and one thing that there's either a placement test that you can take at the beginning, beginning of that whenever you were to take the course to kind of test out to make sure that you've reached the English requirement in order to take other courses at CCBC, or you can submit a transcript. And I don't know the exact GPA requirement on the transcript, um, but if you show that you've taken rigorous courses and a certain GPA, then they'll automatically allow you to, to take the courses. And that's what I did. That is accurate. I believe it's a 2.5 or higher. OK, a second question would be, is there any consideration being given to making personal finance a regular honors course for anyone to take in in the uh, in the in the high schools? Personal finance is a required course yeah. for all of our students to take. It's called personal finance and economic theory, and it replaced the old EPI course. Mr. Billingsley, do you, so all of our students do take personal finance. Mr. Billingsley can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so we do have a uh, personal finance and economic theory, which was the old EPI. Um, course and so what we've done is when we try to translate it to CCBC they don't have that course but they have an econ so we give them credit for they go the econ track or they get the personal finance track so that's how those two correlate with the dual in credit uh, dual enrollment and for for us it is a one semester course in personal finance and economic theory and we offer it as standard honors and GT level thank you so much you're welcome thank you um, go ahead, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Max. So my question is also about the CCBC courses. Um, you know, during the school year, I have taken, I for freshman, sophomore, and senior year, every summer I, I tried to take a CCBC course and I couldn't fit it in during the school year, although that's when they were offered for free. Um, during the uh, fall and semester schedule for CCBC, they were free, but in the summer semester, they were at a cost. And because I am a BCPS student, they were half tuition, but it was still really expensive um, to be able to take those courses. So I'm wondering, uh, and I've, are, are there any conversations with CCBC that are happening right now to maybe see if we can offer some summer CCBC courses for free? So I could take that one right now. No, that is not in conversation. Our memorandum of understanding that we have signed with them is only for during the school year to cover the cost. OK, is there a possibility that, that could occur or is there anything that I could do on the board to help make that occur? So um, it's something. Oh, go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to say, Mr. Thomas, so uh, again, as always, thank you for the vision. And I saw Ms. Causey giving the thumbs up to, on that concept as well, I think. Um, 
you know, our, we currently have an MOU with CCBC. I will tell you that our relationship with CCBC is very robust and I think constantly growing and evolving. So while we, we're not currently in that place, that doesn't preclude us from uh, potentially getting there. So I hear you uh, and I hear the support and, you know, I do secretly want all children in school all year. So because <laughs> uh, I think learning doesn't arbitrarily stop uh, because the sun is out. So um, so I will do some homework to see what is possible in that. Thank right. you. So much. That's not so secret that you want. All right. To all <laughs> I want summer <laughs> learning to be fun, but yeah, yeah. You want it right. Well, we better Mr. go to the next slide. We'll turn it back to you. Yep, back to the next slide. Um, and so we, we talked a little bit about where 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 are people? Where where are, where are people enrolling? Um, and so if we looked at our our highest numbers of enrollments for the this 21-22 school year for the non-AP electives, okay? So psychology is probably our like our number one um, you have juvenile justice you have abnormal psych films and history history through sports so had to add one more christian it would probably be that military history course um, we have high numbers at, at a select schools and the schools that offer it the numbers are really high um, in terms of overall student enrollment and then for the ap courses we're seeing uh, uh, ap us ap world ap psych ap econ ap gov now I will say that even though a, like AP US is offered in more schools, some of the highest enrollment you're going to probably find in the AP Psych course because it's a great introduction to, to the kind of the AP course load. Um, it doesn't kind of build on anything; it's just so kind of self-contained. Um, so you get a, a sample um, of of the highest level or highest enrollment of AP level courses. Yeah, Christian. Thank you. I have a question about AP Economics. So. In for the AP exam for AP economics, there is a micro exam and a macro exam for AP econ. Right. But I'm in AP econ right now and all my transcript, it's one course. Now, is that consistent across all of BCPS that AP micro and macro are combined? They combine to create that one course. OK, interesting. Why do we have it combined instead of having this separate? I know that there are some other school systems that separate microeconomics to one semester and macroeconomics to another semester. Um, I think there's a scheduling kind of a scheduling concept that probably works to package it into a, a one semester course rather than a two half semester courses. Um, it, that's probably why the decisions made. It predates like my decision in doing that. Right. I um, would wonder if and I don't know, but maybe it's possible some of those other systems are semesterized and um, that do it that way. That because... would allow them to do it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. OK, thank you so much. Oh, Ms. Kazi's on. smiling. Before I continue. <laughs> um, I think it's I love the way that we currently offer it because the AP exams happen at the same time in May. And so for students, you know, our teachers do an incredible job of having us review the microeconomic conference right. for the micro exam. So it's great. Yep. Yes, and Ms. Mack put that CCBC does offer them as two different. They, do. they were the classes that I liked the least, just for the record. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not I think believing we... that, Ms. Mack. <laughs> yeah, that 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 wasn't something that I, I look think. forward to yeah <laughs> well for the sake of time I if we have one more slide there I think it's yep. the corner of the question slide there okay so, the, yeah, so the, this is what's coming this is, this is wrapping it up so when we talked about making the changes for the for our electives to move into the honors level so it was consistent across the board right because it's built off of a standard course also for that year we decided to kind of drop some courses because we had very low enrollment or no enrollment so we sunsetted archaeology arts and artifacts, um, world history, the development of law in US and um, uh, US history law related education. They were part of a magnet program. So those we kind of said, hey, we're moving on. And the reason we're doing that is because now that we've cleaned up all of our coursework and we're dealing with decades, decades of, of courses that we had to take off the books and clean up, um, we want to make space for new, for new courses. So currently on our radar, looking forward to not the 22-23 school year, but the 23-24 maybe and moving forward is we there's a women's history course we're interested in um, launching, uh, an LGBTQT plus history that we're interested in launching. Sociology has is gaining a lot of interest and in, in requests from students about that and then media literacy and social justice. And that directly ties to the past couple of years that we've lived in um, have has really pushed that up in terms like that's a course we probably should offer. So those are four of the courses that are sort of on our radar in terms of developing in the upcoming school years. Mr. Billingsley, I have a quick question. Could 
um, world history development of law. Could the development of law piece of that at some point, would, would you see it as being included in the as a topic in the big history? Um, well, I would say, yeah, the development of law would certainly fit within that th um, kind of thematic, thematic approach. Yeah. And I'm willing to bet if I really dug in, like, because it's a there. very robust. It, OK, I'm going to be in the dark again. It, it's probably already there because just like salt is a mineral, like it, it deals right. with so many different things. Law itself is is kind of works the same way. And so that that concept would be very appropriate. OK, thank you. Other yeah. questions, board members? Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I just wanted to state that I, I'm super excited about the future course offerings, women's history, LGBTQ plus history, especially that one, sociology and media literacy and, and social justice. I think those are incredible and I can't wait to see them implemented. Um, a question that I have though is these are all at the high school level in terms of elective courses that are offered to some of our students. Are there any elective courses offered to middle school students in regards to social study and are there plans to offer some maybe? I, I don't see any plans for the for social studies at the middle school level to, to be okay. that case just because of the nature of the scheduling. That well, and I can speak to that a little bit um, as, as uh, Mr. Billingsley said, um, the one of the differences is there's three credit requirements in high school in four years, but in middle school, there's an expectation that they're enrolled in the social studies course each year. So there isn't an automatic space, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and then what are considered more of electives is around uh, meeting the fine arts requirement in Comar for students to have fine arts. And then we also have a new requirement for computational thinking. Um, so as we adjust middle school schedules, there are going to start to be more options and more opportunities for kids to explore. But for right now, it's focused on making sure we meet those changes in Comar regarding computational thinking and um, the fine arts, but all students um, are involved. Now, what is also happening, and I know uh, Mr. Billingsley, we've shared specifically around our um, culturally responsive audit that we've done in curriculum. So many of these topics are showing up more specifically in our middle school um, survey courses. So we are starting to add in more um, uh, resources, first and second person um, sources for uh, primary and secondary sources reflecting um, these different perspectives within the social studies curriculum. So although we don't have plans to offer it as a specific course, we are making concerted efforts to center LGBTQ, women's history, the African American experience, um, and some of our other populations that historically have been marginalized within the core social studies curriculum. Incredible. Thank you so much. And for the courses that we've discussed today, um, are they a mix of some, like half credit courses and full credit courses? If you look back at like African American experience, uh, big history, and then for the future courses, you know, are they typically full credit courses or are most they of the most of those are half credit courses? Most of them are half credit. Okay, and Thank that's you. why it works out really well for in terms of scheduling because you're always trying to pair right. those half credits together. Right. And social studies courses are a great option. And I hope that you see that we have a very robust option. Uh, robust, robust options out there and only working to having greater expansion. Yes, thank Ms. you. Kalsi, I see that you have a question. Go ahead, we'll do the questions. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Ms. Kalsi. Thank you. Um, back with the dual enrollment when you said the classes that were um, offered through CCBC, so are those offered on their campus? I know that in some settings we have the CCBC courses in the schools. So what's the so, distinction? Or Yes, yeah, so we do have some on location courses and some on campus. I don't have in front of me which of the social studies ones are offered, but I can certainly get that as a follow up unless Dr. Wistead knows, but we can certainly follow up. But you're right, there is a combination. Some courses are offered on location um, in the schools. I don't have the breakdown specifically about these, but I can get that. Okay, and CCBC operates on a semester schedule, the fall semester and the spring semester? Yes. And so to Mr. Thomas's earlier point about increasing access to CCBC uh, courses for um, students in the same way that we were discussing uh, a remote uh, teacher, BCPS teacher with specific expertise uh, that could be in, in high level classes that wouldn't necessarily be filled in one high school. Um, is there any uh, consideration for the BC excuse me, the CCBC courses with their professors having a remote option so that a student wouldn't have to 
have the transportation issue and the logistic issue, but be able to sit in a classroom in their high school and take that course remotely. Again, these are students that would have to have shown that they're able to access um, their education digitally, virtually um, to a high degree. So um, Dr. Wistead will be able to speak to this, but I believe some of the offerings are virtual that CCBC offers. So we they do already have some virtual options that students do participate in. So uh, Dr. Wistead has control. control the slides. If you could go back to the ones that are dual enrollment, just for us to be able to see, you know, as examples of what we're discussing. So yes, there are some. I don't know the which ones are virtual, but um, obviously since the pandemic, we uh, we're doing the virtual option. The issue with, um, and I have to verify with Heather, but I believe that the students still have to go somewhere else to log in virtually, right? So like we don't, um, at this time that I'm aware of, the students, if they're in a classroom, they would still need somebody supervising them. So like potentially if they're doing an online course, it would be as if they were leaving to go to their course at CCBC, but they'd leave and they could still virtually do their course somewhere else. But I would have to verify like how it works exactly at every high school. OK, so I'm and I'm I'm just speaking out loud to the library or I know there right. are some students that are supervised in um, the guidance office if they're um, back when we were doing um, a Apex, I believe as a completer. OK, yes, that would be good. And it would be good to know what how all of this wonderful information is distributed to our students so that they can understand what their choices are, um, because it's a lot of um, very good choices and, and we can hear the plans to increase the variety of choices. And so um, that would be the next piece. So thank you. Yes, for all and, of this. and sure. And we've had conversations actually with Mr. Thomas because um, in a recent conversation, I said, let me show you everything that's in the course catalog. Um, and here we have a very active student and he was like, wow, there's a lot more there because it hadn't been offered at his school. He didn't recognize everything else. So we we agree that um, we need to continuously think about ways to get this information to students. And as I mentioned, we've also been in talks of um, how do we make sure students have that sort of pre registration voice to let their administration know what they would be interested in prior to them making those, you know, tough staffing and scheduling choices that we know are really, really hard for our schools to make. Um, so um, we agree we want our students to make informed choices, um, but we also want them to have a voice in advocating for what's the most relevant because we know that they'll be more engaged and, and more successful. So we would agree. Right, and absolutely you're um, speaking to the staffing piece for Staff the principals staff. and the administrators at the schools. It's such a complicated yes. issue. And if some of these um, remote options mm -hmm. could help uh, alleviate the pressures of staffing um, on our principals and then on, on the schoolhouses, sure. that would be fantastic. Yeah, Thank it would you. be a wonderful silver lining from everything we've learned. I think we're finally finished, right, Mr. Billingsley? So I that was our, our last slide. We really uh, thank you, Mr. Billingsley. I want to thank you. Every time we get an opportunity to hear from you, we learn more and we know how passionate you are in the dark or in the light. You are a, <laughs> a light for, for social studies <laughs> and we appreciate you. And thank you, Mr. Thomas, for asking the question because we love any opportunity to talk about what we do. So um, thank you for the time today, Dr. McComas. We'll turn it back to you and Ms. Mack. OK, thank you. Um, so again, thank you uh, to the team and thank you to our committee members for really great questions. You know, I love the robust nature of our discussions because I think it's one of the opportunities we have to really um, ask questions and have real discussion. Uh, so again, we appreciate the opportunity. Um, I don't want to belabor our meeting, so I think Ms. Mack, we're bringing it in even early. <laughs> I know, but I do need to announce that our next meeting is April 21st. Um, and the agenda obviously will be posted ahead of time. And if there's no further business, the meeting is now adjourned. And I would like to thank everybody so much for all the information provided and thank you for anyone who joined us. It's been a great meeting. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks so much. Bye. Enjoy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. Yes, yes. Thank you. Everyone's Irish today. <laughs> I am 74% Irish, so yes. 
I'm 100. I got nothing but Irish. Although someone told me I have to do that 